The torch will be passed to Barack Obama at noon on Tuesday. And though we've all seen the well-practiced ritual before, there's definitely something different in the air this time. Our Chief Washington Correspondent Bob Schieffer reports our cover story. Washington takes large gatherings, pageantry, the important, even the self-important, in stride. But Washington is getting ready for something remarkable, even for this town. And it's not just the crowds, though the capital is bracing for as many as three million people, ten times the number who came to the last presidential inauguration. The parade route will probably be filled by 10 a.m. Washington's young mayor, Adrian Fenty, says for him, the inauguration of Barack Obama will mean one thing, for his children, another. For all of us as adults, you know, he will be the first uh, black president. But for his kids and for kids like mine, from all different races and backgrounds, he will just be the president. They will not know of a country that has never elected a, a black man as president. And so you won't grow up wondering whether or not this country is going to accept uh, everyone at every position. You'll already know it. The inaugural parade will pass just blocks from where riots broke out following the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968, the same place where crowds celebrated Obama's election 40 years later. In a city where history is around every corner, this inauguration stirs thoughts of both the past and the days ahead. It's going to be a lot of people, maybe more people than we've ever seen in Washington. Uh, is that a little daunting? <laughs> daunting is a good word. Linda Douglas is the spokesperson for the inaugural committee, the group that coordinates everything from parade routes to porta potty. In this attempt to make the whole inauguration more open, we've opened up the National Mall for the first time in history in anticipation of so many people coming to Washington who want to be part of this historic event and want to be part of this sense of coming together. For all the coverage that the internet and television will provide, thousands upon thousands are determined not to be turned away. That will mean long lines. A tough time getting around. Even though Obama Most himself all, has actually gone online to suggest Thursday. people watch from home. Fortunately, you don't have to brave the crowds and commotion in order to participate in this celebration. If anyone has paid attention to that, there's no sign of it yet. Who wouldn't want to say I was there when Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address? Who doesn't want to be there when Barack Obama gave his inaugural? CBS News presidential historian Douglas Brinkley says, Well, we welcome immigrants from different... The mark that Obama made as an orator during the campaign has raised like expectations like sky high. Keep the promise of equality and opportunity for all of our people. If you watch horse races, you like to see the horse you're betting on get out of the gate fast. So you, inaugurals are just that. You don't want to stumble out of the gate. That's the pressure on Obama. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend. Back in 1961, the another so young president, me so help me God, felt similar pressure. Let the word go forth from this time and John Kennedy won the presidency by a whisker and faced many skeptics. That the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans but his memorable speech set the country, skeptics on their heels. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Until we speak quietly enough. There have been 11 inaugural so speeches at the Capitol since Kennedy. None has really matched the rhetoric of his speech. But this is a time when the future seems a door you can walk right through into a room called tomorrow. You have to grab them at the beginning. According to William Sapphire, who helped write one of Nixon's inaugural speeches, Obama should also be studying Franklin Roosevelt's 1933 address. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Blast the unreasoning 
uh, terror that was around. And if you read that whole graph, uh, that was a, a grabber. You had to listen to the rest of that speech. It's not the actual phrase, not the words. It's the moment in history. More often than not, the greatest inaugural addresses have come when the nation has been in crisis, when people have looked to the president for leadership. In such times, policy statements often take a back seat to presidential poetry. Think of the crisis Abraham Lincoln faced in 1861. National division was not just a metaphor. Seven states had already broken away from the Union. Yet Lincoln appealed to what he called our better angels. The phrase did not stop the war, but it set the tone for his presidency. That's a poet at work. He was a great president, because not only because he was a great writer, but a great thinker. But if Lincoln's inauguration was a presidential highlight, history has seen more than its share of lowlights as well. William Henry Harrison's speech is remembered mainly for its length. He spoke more than two hours in a driving rain, caught pneumonia, and died after only a month in office. Andrew Jackson's inauguration is famous for the drunken riot that erupted afterwards at the White House. Writer Jim Bendat says some inaugurations were just embarrassing. In 1857, James Buchanan had to have a doctor by his side at all times. There was a little disease running around Washington at the time. They were calling it the hotel disease. Poor Buchanan had diarrhea on his inauguration day. I, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, do solemnly swear. The ceremonies have evolved over time. Even the origin of the closing line of the oath, so help me God, is in dispute. So help me God. So help you God. So help me God. The myth is that George Washington added those words following the inaugural oath in 1789. Yet, no one ever wrote that he said those words until 65 years later in 1854. Maybe he said them, maybe he didn't. Both George Washington and Thomas Jefferson spoke at their inaugurations of their anxiety about taking the job, a position they said they were unworthy to hold. Don't expect such words to cross the lips of Obama or any other modern politician. But Jefferson did express one thought in 1801 that any president would do well to remember. He said, we may belong to different parties, but we are all Americans. That seems to be a common sentiment now in Washington, and that alone is a sign that change really may be coming to this town.